Welcome everyone to uh, tonight's webinar about getting certified with CCHI. My name is Natalia Mitareva. I'm the executive director of CCHI and I was really honored to have been with CCHI from the very beginning as a volunteer commissioner later chair and now the full-time uh, staff person. And the purpose of today's webinar is to discuss the value of certification of for healthcare interpreters and the logistics. Who is eligible? How do you prove that you're eligible? How do you apply uh, to uh, sit for the exams? Uh, Today we will not be talking about how to prepare for the exams. I want you to be clear about that. That would be a topic of the next webinar. Today we're talking about the steps, first step, making a decision why should a person who is working in healthcare as an interpreter want to be certified. Uh, first, a few words about the Certification Commission for Healthcare Interpreters. Uh, we are a national, valid, credible, and vendor neutral nonprofit organization which is incorporated as a 501c6 uh, corporation. We are governed by a volunteer board of commissioners who are elected for. Uh, ter three year terms and they can serve only up to two uh, times on the term and then they'll have to step down. The commissioners represent different stakeholder groups within our industry and the profession and that's really an important distinction because they do not represent an organization with which they are affiliated or with their uh, employer. They represent their professional expertise in the field and the stakeholder groups such as being an interpreter educator, practicing interpreter, certificate by CCHI, um, a manager or a member of a language company uh, or uh, a member of an uh, association of interpreters at uh, different levels. Uh, one of the important parts of our mission is to make sure that our certification programs and exams are valid and credible. And these two concepts are important uh, and have been important to us from the very beginning. And when we formed CCHI in 2009, we uh, made sure that we will build the program in order to meet the accreditation requirements of a third party, a neutral uh, body that looks at certification programs of all professions, uh, and that is the National Commission for Certifying Agencies, the NCCA, that is a division of Institute for Credentialing Excellence. Like within our profession, right, we all know that there are a couple of um, associations uh, or groups that represent the interest of the public and the profession, and among them, for example, is NCIHC, National Council on Interpreting and Healthcare. The same thing for certification or credentialing organizations, NCCA serves at, as that um, neutral body that looks at different programs and evaluates their validity. Um, an important concept for CCHI has also been uh, neutrality in terms of choosing vendors for the exams. We own our own exams. We uh, make all decisions uh, based on the um, uh, good for the profession and for the public uh, when we choose different uh, vendors for different aspects of our programs. Uh, and uh, we don't have any undue influence by from any specific group. Uh, we're very proud that uh, both of our certifications are accredited by NCCA because uh, that accreditation to us, like certification to you, represents the mark of excellence. Uh, it validated uh, that our program uh, met the specific uh, requirements uh, that are best practices for development, administration, or maintenance of a certification program within the credentialing industry. And when I say certification program, I mean not just an exam, because the whole process is evaluated for a, through accreditation. The eligibility criteria that I will talk about in a minute, uh, the content of the exam, how the exam is uh, constructed, uh, how the 
the testing is done, what are the renewal requirements and overall policies that govern candidates and certificates at from the very beginning and throughout the career of them as certified interpreters. So we're very pleased that we met all these criteria. We also, through this accreditation, um, are recognized as an independent and reliable certifying body because only organizations that demonstrate full autonomy and independence of any undue influence get uh, accredited by NCCA. And um, last but not least, the accreditation means for us that uh, we represent a stable organization and a stable certification program because NCCA accredits uh, organizations, and I'm saying specifically here organizations, because they review not just exams, not just programs, but the whole organizations to make sure that uh, they have the capacity to effectively administer certification in a very transparent manner and in the best interest of the general public. And the general public includes not just interpreters, not just educators or employers of interpreters. It includes recipients of our services, which are doctors or medical professionals and patients, and the whole public at large. All the democratic institutions that this country is built on are reflected in the process through which we go voluntarily accrediting our uh, certification programs. So a little bit of history, uh, and I used to say, remember how in 2004 uh, the first uh, national code of ethics or the national code of ethics was created by NCIHC, and now I realize that it's 14 years later, and some of you on this call probably don't remember that and actually studied that in the textbooks, but that year put the became the benchmark or the milestone for our profession because that would differentiate us healthcare interpreters from interpreters of other kinds. In other words, court interpreters or conference interpreters, interpreters in education and other community settings because the code of ethics defines specific parameters that apply only to us. That would put us on the map of the interpreting uh, industry at large and made us very specific. And in 2009, the Certification Commission for Healthcare Interpreters was formed. Uh, within a year, we were able to conduct the first national job task analysis study, which defined what the profession is because until it is written somewhere with a statistical validation that the definition is correct, um, nobody really can say that the profession exists. So that job task analysis allowed us to define a healthcare interpreter. In 2011, we uh, were uh, excited to uh, award first national CCHI certifications to CHI Spanish uh, candidates. In 2012, we submitted and got accredited by NCCA, our CHI Spanish certification program. We started with that program because uh, Obviously, the majority of interpreters practicing in the field in the United States are Spanish uh, interpreters. And uh, we wanted to reach, uh, to meet the need of the majority of the uh, interpreters first. We were very proud to be the first one in the industry to get that uh, certification uh, and accreditation. And we continued understanding that the profession is only as healthy as the training leading towards it. And so in 2013, we founded continuing education accreditation program to make sure that we uh, accredit trainings that our already certified interpreters can rely on to develop their knowledge and skills throughout their career. In 2014, we got the accreditation for our course HI certification program which is available for interpreters of all languages and is the first step into the profession. Uh, and then we started uh, the maturity cycle. We were ready for the second job task analysis, which allowed us to fine tune the definitions of the healthcare interpreter and the tasks that we perform on the job because our exams are based on the results of these statistical studies. The content, the structure of the exams, 
uh, are defined by the national survey, by the input from practicing interpreters like you. And uh, the second uh, step in our maturity was the fact that last year uh, we got reaccredited uh, through NCCA um, for our CHI Spanish uh, certification program. And we're proud to be the only accredited certification in the United States in the interpreting industry as of today. As far as the numbers, those of you who are just planning certification, you are joining a good crowd. We have over 3,300 certified interpreters uh, nationwide, and the numbers grow on a daily basis. Um, as far as where these certified interpreters live, um, it's interesting that 12 states account for almost 80% uh, of all the uh, certified interpreters population. But uh, of course, there is no uh, surprise that California is uh, the first, uh, the top state uh, by the number of certified interpreters. But other states may give you some food for thought. Number two is the state of Wisconsin. So um, we're very proud that there are strong healthcare systems supporting uh, our certification there and advocates and uh, passionate interpreters who just do one thing, go and get certified and persuade their friends to get certified. And that's what put Wisconsin as number two before Texas, before Arizona, before New York, the states which obviously have more um, per capita uh, immigrant population that needs interpreting services that Wisconsin does. But it's up to us, the individual professionals, to push our profession to the, uh, for, uh, to the uh, heights that we can reach. So, I'll let you look at uh, the states. I'm uh, very... Uh, surprised and pleasantly surprised to see that, for example, number six state is Minnesota, and then uh, South Carolina uh, beat, so to say, the state of New York uh, in terms of the number of certified interpreters. But as you can clearly see, these numbers are not too high. Uh, we, uh, in some states, uh, even in the state of Ohio, where I am from, we can all get very comfortably in one room and uh, for a conference. We hope that y the listeners of this webinar will join uh, this uh, very uh, knowledgeable and passionate group of interpreters and get certified uh, as well. Uh, so let me talk about the two certification programs that I mentioned. Core CHI, Core Certification Healthcare Interpreter, is a knowledge-based assessment that tests your knowledge about healthcare interpreting in a multiple choice exam format. In other words, it's 100 questions in English about healthcare interpreting. In our next webinar, I will talk about what are the domains that you need to study for how to prepare for that exam. But the what we value most about Core CHI certification that it allows interpreters of any language to take this exam and be recognized as nationally certified. Uh, that gives leaves no excuse for interpreters of any language because we all have to speak English and interpret into English at the same level regardless of what language we speak. And in a directly that certification because it is presented in English and it asks you to evaluate the common situations on the job and then put your judgment and choose the most appropriate course of action. That certification indirectly tests your critical thinking abilities and your English comprehension abilities as well. The second certification that CCHI administers is Certified Healthcare Interpreter, or CHI. This is a language-specific performance-based assessment. In other words, this is the place where we actually measure, can you interpret? Uh, and at this time, it's available in three languages, Spanish, Arabic, and Mandarin. And this is an oral performance exam where interpreters have uh, 
to uh, listen to some audio recordings of uh, dialogues or in case of simultaneous uh, mode uh, to a monologue of a person in one language interpret it into the other language and record their uh, rendition and then for the side translation portion they read the English text and record their interpretation into Spanish Arabic and Mandarin so the main difference between the two certification is the first one is a about the profession with some aspects of your uh, knowledge of English. The second one is actually prof performance based. You have to prove that you don't only know about the profession, but you also can interpret in healthcare. Um, we are looking at our course HI certification as a continuously improvable uh, program because this year we're planning to uh, engage the field into uh, enhancing and improving it. So please stay tuned through our newsletters and social media to know uh, how we want to uh, make the course HI certification stronger and assess more than what is assessed at this time. One of the important things to uh, for candidates when you prepare for certification exams is to understand who the exam is meant for. And both of our certification programs are intended for the entry-level healthcare interpreter. So let's define that person. It's a person who is able to perform the functions of a healthcare interpreter competently, independently, and unsupervised in any setting and in any modality where healthcare is provided, with the knowledge, skills, and ability required to relay messages accurately from a source language to a target language in a culturally competent manner and in accordance with established ethical standards. If you think about this definition for a moment, you will understand that entry level does not mean a person who doesn't know how to interpret, who can make mistakes. Uh, who doesn't know what is accuracy, who doesn't know what is to maintain, uh, you know, the cultural meaning of a uh, message. Because entry level, the complexity of our job is comparable to the complexity of a neurosurgeon. Because just think of a neurosurgeon, when they show up at the entry level, they just hired by a hospital and they see their first patient and they have to do their first surgery, they should be able to, uh, you know, make the cuts appropriately, fix whatever is wrong with us, either cut it out or zip it, and then sew things up, and hopefully the patient should survive and then live a healthier life than before, right? That's what neurosurgeon does. What does the interpreter do? We show up where it should be able to interpret in any setting, right? From mental health to dental to OBGYN to... Uh, pediatrics to palliative care in any modality over the phone, via video, in person, in a competent manner, meaning we should be able to tackle all kinds of situations that come across that day for us independently. Uh, in other words, if we encounter a problem, we should be able to solve it, be it an ethical problem or managing the encounter problem or a linguistic problem. When you hear a word that you don't understand, you should be able to to clarify the meaning with the speaker and then convey it in a manner that is uh, accurate and complete for that moment, then go home and check it up online or in the dictionary, right? And unsupervised. So that's who we are. We are a very complex profession. And uh, Let's talk about how do you get there through certification and what are the eligibility requirements for uh, becoming a certified. First of all, all the information that I'll share with you is available on our website. The It's a big website. We use it as a... Uh, um, repository of lots of information so it's sometimes hard to find but if you go to community interpreter tab at the top or at the footer and you click on the second bullet healthcare interpreters this is a page where you land and on it you know I it 
strongly encourage you to click on every link and read every page because you will find information about sometimes the same topics but from slightly different angles and that will help you understand the program and what's expected of you but one of the main books for you your uh, go-to book is called candidates examination handbook it's available the first bullet on the page I just showed uh, and we update it constantly uh, because uh, professional changes policies get improved and so right now what you see is the October 2017 version and I know we will have soon either April or May version of the book uh, on um, our website too so read that book carefully it has all the policies it has the description of the exam content it has also the weights in other words how important each part of the exam is and I'm saying the exam but it's both exams course CHI and CHI exams and also has uh, f uh, different policies and free sample questions for the course CHI exam so that's a very important book it's PDF download it and refer to it and um, let's talk about the legibility criteria that's the first thing that you ask yourself are you ready to uh, become certified uh, the first is age requirement you need to be at least 18 years of, of age uh, and that comes from the best practice in our field that interpreters should not be children uh, because the much uh, level of uh, sophistication of our thinking processes and ethical decisions that we have to make uh, are beyond uh, abilities of children younger than 18 years of age. Plus, there are very strong state-by-state uh, -state regulations that uh, require that individuals working in healthcare and coming in contact in treating other pe people should be at least 18 years of age. So that's very easy. Uh, no uh, uh, detail uh, needed here. The second requirement is education or general education requirement. Uh, we intentionally keep it inclusive allowing as many bilingual uh, practicing interpreters to enter the certification field as possible because we recognize we have from so many different backgrounds that not all of us have the opportunity to go and complete education beyond high school uh, when we already are ready to uh, practice as healthcare interpreters however um, uh, we recognize that a uh, high school level of education is the absolute minimum and um, that's uh, the requirement that we have it could be equivalent from any country not necessarily from the United States and then the training requirement again allows us to in be as inclusive and as fair to interpreters of all languages as possible. That's why our training requirement, in other words, professional training requirement, is 40 hours of healthcare interpreter training. It could be through an academic or a non-academic program. And I tried to play with font here, so I highlighted, um, and I italicized healthcare because part of our job is to know healthcare, right? Uh, so these 40 hours need to relate to to healthcare and the other part that's important of our job is interpreter uh, and for that reason it's important that if you are let's say coming from the court interpreting field that you really obtain some training in healthcare settings if you're coming from a healthcare field in other words you were maybe a nurse or a other uh, medical professional in uh, before you uh, came to the United States then you need to hone on your interpreting skill and your linguistic skill and I'll talk about this, uh, what we uh, accept as uh, healthcare interpreter trainings in a second. And then language proficiency requirement. Uh, obviously, interpreter can only exist if they speak two languages. Uh, we, uh, as I said, the course CHI certification is for interpreter for any language, including sign language. Um, and in this case, I mean American Sign Language. Uh, the um, language proficiency uh, needs to be proven for both 
uh, elements uh, of the uh, interpreting encounter, right? So for English and the language of service. Uh, we have on that page that I um, pointed out to you in the beginning, these criteria are listed and you can click uh, there on the eligibility link to read in detail about each one of them. So let me say a few words about uh, what we accept as proof of education requirement. It seemed seems like a very simple thing, right? You have high school uh, and you upload high school diploma, but it only uh, uh, works if you have it, right? If you don't have it, if you're already my age and you start thinking, oh, where is my high school diploma? And I am from Russia, so uh, for me to go back to Russia to get it would be uh, a hardship. So in addition to high school diploma, we also accept GED certificates, college enrollment document um, because in uh, pretty much across the world if you're enrolled in college you need to prove that you completed high school right so it is important if you have the document from especially from the US college uh, saying that you were enrolled even if you didn't finish it we don't care whether you graduated or not but if you enrolled it and this is a official document proving that that could serve as your proof of meeting the education requirement. College transcripts, obviously, because they will also testify indirectly that you have been accepted to college and then, uh, you know, completed uh, some coursework. Any college degree, bachelor's, master's, PhD, if you don't have high school diploma, but have a higher one, we accept that in lieu of high school diploma and um, confirmation of a refugee or asylee status because we understand that refugees do not have the luxury to pack their important documents. Uh, they could uh, be destroyed in the um, during the events that led to uh, them becoming refugees or asylum seekers. So when the United States admits refugees in this country, they receive a refugee document. That document uh, is uh, acceptable in lieu of high school diploma. And the same thing if you got accepted as for asylum hearing, which again, we don't care if you, about your determination. This has nothing to do with immigration status. This is just to be fair to individuals who do not have the ability to provide a piece of paper proving that they have submitted, they completed high school. Um, the caveat here is if your documents are not in the English language, make sure that you upload with your application translations of those documents and a scanned copy of the original document. So then you have to have it. In my case, it would be a Russian and English. Both uh, need to be uploaded as uh, one document. Healthcare interpreter training requirement. So. Uh, we also understand that still not every uh, interpreter has access to a full 40-hour training program. Uh, it sounds to some of you like, oh, how come we have bridging the gap, the community interpreter, the uh, advanced medical interpreter certificates, lots of programs offering this pro uh, these uh, trainings. But yet still, if you live in a rural place or if you're an interpreter of a language of li a limited diffusion, if you work full -time, time and a different job and interpreting is just your uh, way of uh, helping uh, the community or supplementing your income, you may not have the opportunity to sit straight for 40 hours. For that reason, we accept 30 hours in any combination on the subject of healthcare interpreting. In other words, it could be medical terminology, ethics of healthcare interpreting, managing the interpreting encounter in healthcare. Any of those uh, hours uh, could uh, would count. Um, you also accept five hours attending any interpreting conference. For example, if you are a court interpreter or interpreter for the deaf uh, and attended those uh, specialty conferences, five hours automatically count regardless of what the subject of those conference was. Uh, and then five hours are ca counted to relate to professional trainings that 
again, is either your interpreting part, which is court, conference, or sign language, um, or to your medical specialty. We, as you know, there are many interpreters who become interpreters in the United States because they decided not to pursue their medical specialty that they practiced back in their home country. So, but yet their training as a nurse in um, uh, Russia, for example, will provide them with five hours of training, but they still need to get the 35 hours of uh, training related to medical interpreting, to linguistic aspects of our profession. So it is not a hard requirement to meet nowadays with more and more online um, programs available and more and more in-person opportunities than it was in 2009 when we started the program and we're very pleased to see that uh, we uh, pretty much that is not uh, a hindrance to becoming uh, certified uh, a couple of just uh, comments that these hours should be training they're not interpreting we don't require you to have work experience as an interpreter so if you submit a document saying that even from your company saying that you've worked as an interpreter for the last 15 years that does not count as the training requirement it has to be training and it cannot be self-study because uh, personally, I like to study statistics on my free time, but it doesn't mean that I uh, qualify as have completed some statistical courses. No, I just read books and articles about it. Um, we do accept on-the-job training, which could be provided by your employer, but you, because we require you to upload document, and in case when you complete a training program, you usually get a certificate of completion, right? Or a certificate of attendance. With the on-the-job training, what you need to upload is a document on the official letterhead of the company that says that they did that job on-the-job training for you, where it has your name, that organization's contact information that provided the training, the date and specific hours of training. In other words, it cannot. It, it could say something like uh, between January 1st and February 14th, they, we provided on-the-job training, but they have to specify how many hours on what topics. It cannot be just about healthcare and shopping. It should say like December, I mean, January 4th, one hour introduction into interpreting role. Uh, January 6th, four hours healthcare interpret ethics. That's what that document sh should document to qualify as um, proof of the on-the-job training in the profession. That is done so that we feel certain we're not just taking your money for the exam, but you are really prepared and you know what to expect on the exam. Language proficiency requirement. Again, we ask you to upload the documentation that uh, evidences that you are proficient in English and the other language, in your primary language of service, language of interpreting. Uh, and uh, if, like in my case, there will be two pages or two documents, one is the Russian document, the other one is its translation into English, you need to provide a scan and uh, upload them as one file. So let's talk about what we accept for English, proof of English proficiency, right? Uh, and uh, I'm uh, going to give an example of an interpreter for whom English is not a native language, right? Uh, so if you have a high school diploma or it's equivalent from an English-speaking country, not from the United States, but let's say you were uh, raised in uh, Liberia or in Great Britain, right? High school diploma from those two countries or India, if the instruction was done in English, would be proof of your English proficiency or a transcript of uh, high school uh, studies. Uh, make sure that on that document there is a country name because sometimes I know uh, there are some pages where of the transcripts especially where there is no country, just the transcript itself. Another example could be any post-secondary education degree uh, where the majority of classes were conducted in English. In other words, you came here with a Russian high school diploma, but then you took the college uh, courses and became uh, got a bachelor's from a United States uh, college. 
that would be that degree is your proof of English because obviously you were successful in understanding it uh, since you graduated. Um, any time spent studying or working in an English speaking country where you're were required on a daily basis to perform tasks at the professional level. For example, if you were hired to teach uh, a course uh, in an English-speaking country, uh, or uh, you were a manager of some business, uh, but it was conducted, the business was conducted in English, that also allows you to prove your proficiency. The easiest ones, those were the hardest ones, right? For uh, us, it's like non-traditional. The easiest one is if you actually pass the language proficiency test from any reputable uh, testing organization. There are many of them. TOEFL will be fine. Actifl or ILR scale exams, they all will be fine. And there are several others. I'm not going to name them all, but it has to say that you pass the language proficiency English language proficiency test and they should specify the level if that's how the testing is done. Um, an easier yet way of proving your English proficiency and by the same token the proficiency in the other language is any uh, certification exam in related area. For example, federal course certification exam. If you a federal court certified interpreter obviously we know you speak English and Spanish uh, if you passed a state certification exam court certification exam in other languages I think they have like about eight of them so again that's your proof of both languages um, other national certification exams by ATA, even though it's translators, but obviously uh, you had to demonstrate your English abilities. BI, which is an uh, entity for sign language interpreters and interpreters for the deaf in Texas. NAGIT, NBCMI, RID, State of Washington interpreter certification. So all these passing all of these exams, that certificate will serve your dual role to prove that you have English proficiency and the proficiency in the other language. So if you look at the language proficiency for the other language, language of service, same thing. Uh, in my case, Russian high school diploma shows that I am proficient in Russia, uh, in Russian. Or if I, in my case, I also have master's degree from Russian university that shows my proficiency in Russian. Um, and I taught in uh, Russia, both in high school and in university. That also becomes that, you know, contract uh, that I had with the school could be another document that I can submit. And as uh, I explained, uh, all these uh, certification exams. And in case of refugees, as we as I explained earlier, the document uh, proving their refugee status in the United States also qualifies as their proficiency in the country, uh, in the language of the country of, uh, f uh, from which they uh, fled. So let's talk about money. How much does it cost? So let's say you are qualified. You meet these four criteria. You are ready to apply. So how much money do you need to spend? So the initial fee is $210. It includes $35 for the application where our staff would review all the documents you uploaded. If they you made a mistake and uploaded something different, they will email you and make sure that you know this is all straightened out. And then the course HI exam fee, $175. The reason we collect them together is within the application, as soon as the application is approved, within 48 hours, you receive an email allowing you to schedule for the course HI exam. We don't want you to, uh, you know, wait long. So that's why we collect fee once. If, however, during the application review process, it is clear that you don't meet eligibility criteria, we will refund you $175 within 10 business days. No questions asked. We do keep the application fee because of the processing uh, effort going into its review. And of course, you have the uh, mechanism for appealing the decision if you think we misunderstood your documents. You'll have the appeal uh, uh, process uh, via email that we can review it again. If you're an interpreter of Arabic, Mandarin, or Spanish, uh, then uh, we uh, then you have to take the second exam. That's the oral performance exam, and that cost is two hundred seventy-five dollars. Um, 
want you to keep in mind that fees are non-refundable uh, and uh, therefore one take of the exam. In other words, if you unfortunately don't pass an exam, you'll have to pay 175 again and 275 again uh, until you pass the exam. Now, we do have um, special uh, fees for individuals who already have one certification and want to add CCHI certification just because they may be practicing translators but also uh, work as healthcare interpreters that's if they already certified by ATA or if they're sign language interpreters who are already certified by BI RID from previous certification years uh, we don't really uh, uh, you know, as long as it's the active certification, in other words, that it did that uh, each of these organizations have their, you know, their validity of certification for a certain number of years. If you have the document proving that you are actively certified by these organizations, then uh, we offer you special pricing. Any court cert certification, federal or state, a certification by NBCMI, by the state of Washington. Um, what we uh, you still have to submit an application but we waive your fee and the course HI exam fee is $150 and for the oral exam for Arabic Mandarin interpreters your CHI exam fee is also $150 in other words $300 total uh, if you are uh, already certified by um, let's say ATA or federal court certified or NBCMI that's all it will take you and of course your effort to pass our exam to become um, also CCHI certified. We do that in recognition that many of us cross different paths, uh, work for different employers as freelancers and different employers may have different requirements. So uh, yet uh, we obviously know that if you pass exams of any of those organizations then you do meet our application requirements. So even though we will still look at every document that you upload, we waive the fee just as um, a goodwill to uh, encourage you to add this certification. Now, um, let uh, me quickly look at some questions that you already put at this moment, and I will do questions and answers at the end as well, but just this is a good moment to stop for the technical questions. One of the questions I see here is how recent the TOEFL results have to be. Um, we really don't have the uh, time limit on language proficiency exams because we just need you to prove the minimal language proficiency through that document, uh, not how high you are, because ultimately you have to take and pass our exam to get our certification. So it is just that screening process for us. Um, another question is, um, I was born in uh, Saudi Arabia and um, I'm a native speaker of Arabic. Uh, yes, so if you got any document, what documentation should I provide? So you need to provide your high school or college uh, degree from Saudi Arabia. That would be a proof of your Arabic language uh, proficiency and then you have to provide some document that proves that you are also English proficient uh, and all those documents I um, uh, mentioned uh, would qualify for that. All right, so let's move on to the logistics of how do you actually apply. Um, on our website, Again, you need to get to that landing page, Healthcare Interpreters. It's from the community page. Uh, and that second bullet here says apply or, or continue your application. Also on our website at any page on the right, the top button is called login to your CCHI account. So these are the two ways to enter into the application process and then continuously return to it throughout your whole career. So what you, happens when you click on these links is you are taken to this portal which hosts our CCHI uh, profiles for all applicants, candidates and certificates. First time you press this orange button, click uh, register as an applicant and that will allow you to create the username and password and then you uh, will click on this button to log in 
anytime you come back to this website you just uh, one of the hints I want to give you your user ID is always your email uh, that's how our system differentiates candidates and makes it unique make sure that you pick the email that will stay with you for a long long time uh, we really don't encourage you to use your employers email address try use your own gmail yahoo's and all other uh, possible emails but uh, especially be careful with the dot edu email addresses because when you graduate they you may lose access to that email you can always change it but it's just easier to have your main personal email address as your user id for our account so when you click you get your simple sign in with the email you Pick your password, we ask your name, last name, home phone number, and your address. Uh, and then uh, you click to save. And as soon as that happens, you get the pop up. And I strongly encourage you to read what it says. You know, we all have done so many accounts, and sometimes we just like nod our heads and don't even read. But here is the important thing please check your email for the confirmation code because it is a two step authentication. Just submitting that, clicking that once uh, for security reasons won't create an account for you. So you need to go to your email, and here I'm going back to Yahoo. You will see an email from apply at cchicertification.org. It will say Learning Builder. That's our vendor who does uh, keep our database of applications in a secure and uh, managed location. So when you click on that email, how you can recognize it's not a spam. You see here is the word CCHI, and it here is your confirmation code, which you, you can either click on the link in the email or you go back and type in and paste that um, confirmation code into um, our website uh, pop-up. After that, the process automatically leads you to start the actual profile or account creation. Uh, it's not an application yet, it's just your account because we want to uh, make sure that we get other information that will help us down the road to uh, navigate you through the application process. And some of these fields will pre-populate the, the application further. So you will need to select your language just for, uh, you know, keep in mind that whenever you see that that arrow that means you need to click on it and there will be a drop down list um, if accidentally you click out and this window closes or you don't save it and closes you'll see this don't panic you know you have your email you have your name all you need to do is need to con click this orange button continue application again a little tip whenever there is an orange button that means you need to do something with it uh, or you can do something with it so and as soon as you click that continue application that screen pops right back where you stopped uh, or if you didn't save it it'll be blank again uh, and you can uh, you know start with selecting your primary language doing different things there putting which you know uh, who is your employer that is the birth date to show that you are 18 years of age, right? Um, your highest level of education. This is an important field because this is how your name will be listed on the certificate after you pass the certification exams. So if you, in a hurry, put your name in a short way, but uh, on your official documents, it's slightly different. And, you know, uh, we immigrants have very interesting naming uh, patterns. So make sure here you put it exactly how you need it. If ever during the process, you change your name for any reason, happy or unhappy ones, or just out of uh, uh, desire, you need to send us the document showing your previous name and your new name. You will not be able to change this on your own. We will have to do it by uh, for you. Uh, that is, again, one of the security features, so people randomly won't start changing names in the um, our database. Then you click Continue. Again, another button, green, is usually a good uh, indication that you uh, are free to go. And that completes your profile your account you are taken to the screen to indicate that now you are ready to start your actual application you click the orange button begin and with that 
you have the application, which is, if you look at it, it has these four eligibility criteria, educational background, healthcare interpreter training, primary language, and statement of understanding. That's where your language proficiency is uh, uh, qualified, and then you submit application. Whenever the button is gray, that means you didn't do something yet. Another tip here, whenever it is these bars are blue, that means, again, you didn't finish them. But let's go step by step. So educational background. We give all the instructions that I just told you right here. We give a direct link to Candidate's Handbook if you want to refer to it. So take your time, read it. Um, on average, the application, if you are ready beforehand and have all your files on your computer ready and have uh, you know read the Candidate's Handbook, it really takes 20 minutes. If you haven't done all that, that could be about 45 minutes to an hour. But it's very simple, even though to explain it takes me a whole hour, too. So you start by clicking Add Diploma or Degree. And the first pop-up is you need to choose which degree. Uh, again, whichever one you have the document closely available. This is just to prove that you meet the minimum requirement. We have people who put all the degrees, people who just put one doctoral, people just put high school, whichever you, is you are comfortable with. Um, after you select the type of the degree, we're actually asking you for specifics, the name of the schools, the actual, you know, year, the city and state, the country of the school. The, uh, and again, those are free short answers. You type in uh, whatever the country is called that uh, in, um, you know, uh, customarily, doesn't, we don't care about the, por, por, uh, the actual format. You can put USA, you can put United States. We do have human beings reviewing these things. I just want all of you to be comfortable with that. This is The application is online, but it's human beings who review your applications, and they can, you know, ask you questions if they need to. That's why there is this field comment to the uh, applicant, if they review and something doesn't click, uh, like, for example, you accidentally put the year of graduation before you were born, right, uh, they will send it back to you via email by typing in here uh, the question they have. And this is an important button which asks you to upload your document proving that educational background. If you've done it right, this is what it will look like. Like here I have just an example high school diploma with my last name. If you realize by the name, oops, instead of uh, diploma, I upload my shopping list, you just click on this uh, icon at, of a trash can and it will delete it and the button upload appears again and you can re-upload it again. So it's all very customizable. And then you click uh, the button to take you to the next step. Uh, and as you can see now, this bar, which was blue before, became green, meaning you completed it because uh, you recorded at least one document. You can continue adding your diplomas, you know, bachelor's and master's. It's totally up to you. The next section is healthcare interpreter training. And again, here, I encourage you to read again the requirements if you've never, if it is the first time you're uh, online, then you click add training button and again the first thing it asks you is kind of to identify what type of training it was uh, it just for our internal uh, speed of the process if it's on the job training obviously there are documents are less standard that if it is uh, any other kind of uh, uh, training but uh, in general I wouldn't worry uh, too much about what you select uh, at this particular screen because again we have human beings who are reviewing your application and if you made a mistake and put academic training when it was non-academic doesn't really um, uh, affect whether your application is accepted or not. Um, that's the actual screen to Put the specifics about your training. We need you need to know the title of that program, the hours, the name of the institution, or if it was an individual, because there are freelance educators as well as freelance interpreters, you need to make sure you put their full name there. Um, we strongly encourage you to avoid abbreviations, even though it seems like people who graduated like me from Bridging the Gap know what BTG is. 
but there is no guarantee that we don't hire a new reviewer for whom on the first day of job who has no clue what BTG is. So it's important uh, that you make it as simple as possible uh, because uh, what we often see is, uh, I forgot what the course is, but it's something like medical interpreter training. That's the title of the course. I understand that if it is tied into some other details, it's clear, but as such, it's so non-descriptive. For that reason, we do ask you to upload the document that tells you that you actually completed it, but we also ask you, and here is what it will look again like if you uploaded it uh, correctly, to describe. And what we mean by description is the actual topic, because if your top, if your subject of your 40-hour course was like here I created one best 40-hour healthcare interpreter training right uh, that won't tell the reviewer anything especially if it's some company that is not very well known in our industry yet uh, what our reviewers do they actually do verify all this not just by looking at your document, but actually finding online that company, looking at their website, do they actually offer this training? And that includes colleges or private institutions. And if they cannot find traces of this, then they will email you. And until you provide proof of verifiable uh, documentation that this course existed, we won't move the application. So describing the topics would also help. So it's important that you list which topics were covered at the training. And another hint here, whenever you see the asterisk next to a field, that means it's mandatory and you cannot leave it blank. Um, then you click to move you to the next step. Uh, one more tip I wanted to uh, give you, with all these uh, uploaded uh, elements, you have this little icon of gears. If you click on that uh, gear, what happens here is you can either recall this step, and when you click recall, you can edit. For example, you put here 40 hours, but you meant to put 20 hours. You can just recall it and change just that, or you put the date wrong for some reason. So, but if, or you you have the option of deleting that uh, item. If there are no gear next to the en uh, entry, that means that uh, only we on our administrative end can make that change and you have to send us an email. The good thing is there is only one email that covers all applications from initial through renewals. It's apply at cchicertification.org and I'll give you that email at the, uh, in the, uh, at the end of the presentation. Too. So now we have uh, we're moving into primary language. Again, you click the orange button, select language. You have the drop down list here. I put here, for example, Russian, and then you click again, select language to make the system save it. Uh, and then you move on to the statement of understanding. The statement of understanding, the full text of it is available in the handbook, so you can read it at leisure ahead of time. But basically, you still have to affirm that you meet the four eligibility criteria by clicking yes, because that this section is a legally binding contract between you and CCHI, that you will be playing by our rules and we will be playing by uh, the rules that we are stating in that statement of understanding. This is also the area where you're going to upload your uh, English proficiency and the other language proficiency documents. Again, it's only one document, so if it's multiple pages, like original in translation, scan them as one document, and the instructions are here again. Uh, and then you click to um, uh, continue this way. You see you selected all yeses. You uploaded both documents successfully. Uh, this is your last check. If you uploaded the wrong document, you delete it and re-upload it, then you click continue and you get to the text of that contractual agreement that I just mentioned. There are many interesting things here that you may think not think about among them about ADA accommodation. If you require a special accommodation during your exam, you need to read our policy and submit all the documentation four weeks before the exam. Uh, we also here explain how when you need to take certain exams because you, you have only six months after this application is accepted to take the course HI exam. Uh, 
uh, and uh, then one year to take the CHI exam, that you're not going to re misrepresent your core CHI certification as language specific because it is not, right? Uh, so all these kind of th regulations that you'll be abiding by policies, including uh, disciplinary policy, confidentiality policy, and other policies instituted by CCHI. So you have to select yes here and then click uh, and that completes your application. So you can see it's very straightforward. It's a lot of clicks, clicks, but nowadays, whenever you buy anything, you also don't do it with one click necessarily uh, for security reasons. Um, what uh, happened, as I indicated, remember that button was gray, now it became orange, and you can click Submit. Uh, here you can provide any comments to us. Uh, we always welcome any feedback. Um, and appreciate any other comments as well. Um, and then you click pay fees. But this is also your spot if you forgot, if you wondered where can you request ADA accommodation, this is your place. If you forget about it, don't worry, just email us and we will, uh, you know, uh, work with you outside of the online module. So it's, we always uh, provide accommodations. Uh, we had candidates who were, had some, uh, various kinds of conditions, including uh, low vision and blind individuals who work as remote interpreters. So um, when you click pay fees, here is the tricky one. What it seems we all tend to do, and I did it myself when I was renewing my certification last time, you kind of start filling out the fields. No, read. It says here, click pay fees to make a personal credit card payment. So this is the button you really need to click to pay if you are paying yourself. And that would take you to the normal screen, you know, that is, we do not capture any of your credit card. This is a, um, a personal or customized view of PayPal secure checkout. So uh, we don't store this information. Nobody could steal it from us because we don't have it. It goes directly into PayPal account and then PayPal releases funds to us through our PayPal account. So you fill out this application, click continue and uh, magic happens when we buy anything online. So if you yourself don't pay, but you have a really good employees, and I must say that we have more and more hospitals who pay for their employees to get certified or reimburse afterwards. So two uh, versions exist. So, but if your employer is prepaying, that's when you fill out that um, these fields, uh, but only see how we kind of screamed at you here online with. Uh, uh, capital letters if the employer has agreed uh, because what after you sub submit this information we're not going to contact the employer the employer has to send us the information how they're going to pay we can send them an invoice uh, and they pay it in different ways uh, including by check individuals cannot pay by check because we simply do not have the capacity you know with more manual labor we put into the process the higher the examination fees, because all these fees do, they cover the labor we put into processing your applications, your test exams, communicating with you. So that's why only the employers who already know how they're going to pay should be listed in this field. And then you click the button employer payment. And what happens then is we understand that people make mistakes. We'll have a warning. Are you sure your employer pays your fees, right? Uh, and if you are sure, then you click ignore, or you can click employer payment. Either of these two orange buttons really work. But if you made a mistake, this is your chance to click this pay fees button and pay yourself with a credit card. Um, another tip, if your employer is paying with their credit card, and they do it in your presence, just use this button because really you don't get any brownie points for having the employer pay here if they're using the credit card. They can just put their credit card number here because again, we don't store it. It's not stored in the receipt uh, or in any way. So it's not captured for uh, nobody will see which credit card it was. 
after you clicked employer payment that's what uh, your status becomes awaiting employer payment until we receive the payment for that person if at any moment something happened you changed employers or your boss left and a new boss doesn't have the time for this yet then you contact us at apply at CCHI certification.org we unlock it and we allow you to pay again online by clicking pay fees button now, how do you know that everything worked? Well, first of all, we send you emails. The system sends you gener automatically generated emails as soon as you do every step. Uh, and you can find them in your normal inbox. But we also recognize because the emails will be coming from um, an automated uh, account, uh, some email providers block these things or mark them as spam. So make sure that you make at cchicertification.org, that's our handle, a friend or preferred sender or whatever other magic you need to do or not spam that in your Gmail and Hotmail especially uh, accounts you can find our e emails. However, there is a simple second way of doing it. If you log in to your account, click on that button in the top right hand corner, my account, you'll have all these different tabs. And in my communications tab that's highlighted in yellow right now, you will have all the emails from CCHI that was sent to you in connection with your testing. This is how you notice the schedule will come, your scores will come, your renewal application reminders, all this will come to you into this area. So it's always stored here. So you don't really have to have an email. If you log in, make a point of logging in every so often to your account, you will know all the news you need to know. And your confirmation that your uh, payment came through is here, as you can see in this example, or your uh, certificate, your application was approved, you got this email. You can always go back to your application to check on your status if you want by clicking on that tab. And here is the status you are ready for scheduling. In other words, that within a couple of uh, 48 hours, you will get the notice to schedule and you can actually call scheduling. Um, the, in your eligibility uh, email, the one that I just, you know, was uh, highlighting, uh, you get the explanation that your application got approved and it says that within two weeks you'll receive a notice to schedule. Uh, we Try to shorten it that period as much as you can. As soon as you get the notice to schedule, that's an email which has all the instructions how to prepare, who to call to schedule the exam, and where to find the test sites um, in the exam. You also can get print out receipts for your payment. If from my account you go to payment history, this view receipt, that's a PDF that you can print out to show to your employer for reimbursement. And it also shows what you paid and what you didn't pay yet. Um, how long does all things take? Well, application, uh, let's say you it took you one week to prepare all the documents and submit your application. We review applications within one to two weeks. Uh, sometimes, uh, since we, uh, some of our, you know, our staff, since our staff does their application reviews all, all usually on Wednesdays. If you submitted it on Tuesday, you may get it reviewed on Wednesday. It'll be just one day waiting. But normally, it's about. 10 days uh, waiting period and then uh, you get your notice to schedule um, again within a week of the application approval. You can take your course HI exam at any time because it's it's administered throughout the year. Uh, at the time, uh, the only limitations are when the test site is available. So you, we suggest you call as soon as you can. You can only book it three months in advance because you know people's schedule change very fast. So that's why it's a three months in advance scheduling, no longer than that. And then you receive your scores. The good thing with the course HI exam because it's multiple choice. You see the whether you passed or not right at the test site. You print the proctor will print out the exam uh, results for you but then we will send you an official score with the same email you can log into your account and see if you got it or not and the certificate as a PDF file 
that's all for people who are not Arabic, Mandarin, and Spanish. If you are the interpreter of those three languages, then you move on to the next step of the CHI exam. You need to, at that point, when you got the scores from the course CHI exam, to pay for your written exam, get now just to schedule and schedule your exam. These exams, oral exams, are administered in four testing windows every quarter, so it's like mid January, mid February, mid April, mid May, mid July, mid August, mid October, mid November. Those are the three week windows that you can take these exams. All the data on our website are available already for this year. Um, and then you receive the scores. It takes us between six to eight weeks to score the oral exams from the last day of the testing window. It is done for the objectivity of the scores. The more exams the raters have to uh, score, the more random the system gives them those exams to score, so there is no bias by any specific rater. I wanted to point out that when you create your account and when you get certified, it's important that you recognize that we have a public obligation to allow the public to verify your certification and it also serves as a way for employers to find certified interpreters. So from any page on our website uh, we have that second button which says find a certified interpreter and that's the screen looks the same right that's your screen where you log in but here is credential verification or interpreter registry or you can click on this tab either way works um, and uh, here people can search by state by status like CHI course CHI or candidate they can search by the language so I just did a random search by the state of California and as you can clearly see out of four people only one listed their email how does this work well we strictly follow your privacy, the privacy uh, policy, and by default, the only thing that we show is your name, city, state, and your status that you are actually certified. And people can click on that um, icon that represents a download arrow. When you click here, you get a PDF document that shows when the date you got certified and how long it is valid until what date it is valid and what your certification is. So you can print it out and give it a, as a verification if you don't have the certificate handy. But if you want employers who do look at our registry regularly find you and contact you, you need to make your email available. And this is how you do it. You log in and from my account you click on this tab, Accounts Details. And if right below your email you will have the status and you need to click Edit Status that little icon with the notepad and a pen on it and when it unfolds what you see is this area make contact information available and then you don't forget to click save and by doing that you make your email available we never make your home address or um, phone number available only email so that you have the full um, control of how you respond to uh, employers inquiries you can also change your phone numbers if they do email addresses. Again, I mentioned it once, but uh, that we encourage you to have your personal email as your primary address. However, if you need to use non-personal one, please include a second one because uh, four years, that's the length of your certification validity, is a long time and if things change and we need to reach out to you to remind you about your renewal uh, and your email balances, that's just not good for anybody because we, and we also want to make sure that you have the current home address because uh, if we cannot reach you by email, we will try to reach you via uh, regular mail. Just brief comments about how can you start preparing for the exams without going into much details. On our website, the easiest way to think find things is from the footer. So the second column, the last bullet is called certification resources, has lots of materials. Review them. Um, and then uh, we also have a special online training portal. Uh, its address is slightly different than our main website address. It's HTTP without W's, cchiinterpreters.org. 
and the link is from that resources page too. So here you create a free account. That one is much simpler, just your name, email address, name, and password. No other information uh, needed. Uh, make sure you write down that username and password because it's different. It's a different location than your profile, than your account. It's, it's a special add-on for training purposes only. What's good about and you can log into it after you create the account. You can log in. It's at the very top left corner, right above CCHI's logo. That little thing, login. Um, so why do I recommend you to register on that portal? Because this is where you can get some preparation material for both exams. First of all, we have a course HI practice exam available here for thirty dollars, and we have free practice exams for oral exam in. Spanish, Mandarin, and Arabic, and all you need to do is enter the key study for you. It's all written here and in the body here, and every time you click anywhere, it'll explain you where to find the keys, but that's where the key is. Um, if you took one practice exam, then what you will see first when you log in is my courses and all the courses that you took listed, like here I have my three listed. If you want to further explore what we offer. You need to scroll to the very bottom and here is all courses. When you click there, you can actually see more than just practice exams, but some continuing education uh, trainings online, uh, some in Spanish, some in Mandarin, we're adding Arabic shortly, and some in English. They're very you know, reasonably priced at $10 with our uh, gratefulness and um, thankfulness to the presenters who uh, authorized and donated their time uh, to create these portals for you and for CCHI. Um, they are mainly meant as continuing education and it would be of great help to you after you get certified, but if you just want some idea of some topics, you can also use them before you get certified as an informational uh, material. Um, I hope you all will pursue certification and I want you to plan your future ahead of time. Your certification is valid for four years and after that, during these four years, you need to make sure you meet our continuing education requirements and work experience requirements. Uh, you Every two years, you will need to submit an application. We track them in two-year periods. And the requirements are the following. For two years, you need to have 16 hours of continuing education, out of which two must be performance-based topics. In other words, topics about modes of interpreting an actual practice by with an instructor of consecutive simultaneous or site translation modes. And then um, four hours could be non-instructional activities. We strongly encourage your engagement with the profession. Out of these four hours, some hours could be your membership, just membership in an association of interpreters or translators. Uh, it could be uh, being on board or volunteering for different uh, projects for these associations or for CCHI. Um, it could be volunteering for uh, different uh, missions that uh, medical professionals lead outside of the United States, like Doctors Without Borders, etc., uh, or research and publishing of books and articles about medical interpreting is also accepted as your continuing education. We want you to stay engaged with us. Uh, right now, the way you can do it is either by connecting through our social media, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and we do have Instagram, just our handle there is CCHI certify on Instagram. Um, on either of these links, get new, subscribe, or get involved. You can connect to us. Um, we do have webinars periodical, and the next one upcoming is going to be about how to prepare. How do you know? We usually post them, of course, on the homepage. But then under the Stay Informed tab, uh, get news, we have that CC, uh, CCHI webinars page, which has recordings and announcement of the future webinars. 
And uh, now I'm going to look at the questions that you have asked and uh, uh, spend uh, some time answering them. But I want to point out the email that is your mantra email for all your life with CCHI is apply at cchicertification.org. Um, it is uh, reviewed uh, daily in the order of receipt, not priority, but receipt, so first come, first serve, in other words, by our staff, uh, and uh, they usually take between 24 to 72 hours to respond to your emails. Um, with that, uh, let me uh, look at your questions. <clears throat> 